Hi, my name is Jordi Izzard and I am a SAIS Alumni Relations Officer here in Washington, D.C. And I am here today on January 9th, 2013 with Roberta Cohen, who is graciously uh, here at, for an oral history interview. She uh, attended SAIS Washington, D.C. in 1961. Um, then attended uh, the Bologna SAIS campus in 1962 and received her degree in 1963. So is celebrating her uh, 50th anniversary this oh year. <laughs> and we are so happy to have you and thanks so much for taking some time. And we'll basically just have a little bit of a conversation. And why don't we start with what originally brought you to SAIS? Well, I was a history and a political science major at Barnard College in New York. And I was very interested in international relations. And when I graduated, uh, I realized that I knew a lot of theory, uh, but I didn't know anything practical about foreign policy. Uh, the courses at Barnard and at Columbia, and I could have gone on to get my master's at Columbia, uh, were all in the realm of theory, really, theoretical looks at international relations. Whereas when I looked up SAIS, I'd heard about it, I can't remember who mentioned it, but I saw what a wonderful blend of practical foreign policy experience and uh, academic uh, background. And I just loved that. I saw that the faculty were people who actually worked in the government or did work in the government and had that experience. Mm -hmm. So that excited me very much that I would really learn something that I could use and that I would have a better understanding of foreign policy at the practical, real level, not just the theoretical level. Um, so this was the this was what drove me. And then when I had my interview, uh, I loved uh, the, the building Sice was in when I began was a little old house on Florida Avenue, and it was so non-traditional. Uh, there was a living room inside, and you could go sit there in these big floppy chairs and read or meet your friends. Um, the library was, you know, in Columbia University has an enormous library, as do most universities. And this, uh, maybe on the second floor or whatever of, the, of this house, there were several rooms that had books in them. So it was very informal. Uh, it was an experiment, really, teaching, practical, and... Um, also academic sides of international relations. And I don't remember when the school was founded. Do you, do you know when SAIS began? I believe the first graduating class was 1945. 45. So yeah. it wasn't, um, it, it was a kind of a new idea, I think. And um, I had the feeling, being there, that this is something a little different. And I like that atmosphere very much. Mm -hmm. That's great. And when you were in Washington in 60, 61, and then in Bologna in 61, 62, tell us, um, and you can start with either, but uh, share with us, if you would, some of your memories from that experience. Um, well, <clears throat> from SAIS in Washington, uh, there were very few women at that time. I think there were about five in the whole school, something like that. Mm -hmm. And so I had come out of a women's college, mm -hmm. and suddenly I was with all men practically. And in those days, uh, some of the students didn't take women seriously, particularly in the field of international relations. So it was kind of as if you were there to find a husband uh, for some students, not for faculty. I didn't have that experience. Um, but that was a little bit, uh, a little awkward at times. Um, but one gets used to it, but it was just, it was just an experience. Um, but it also told me that uh, the field of international relations was not that open to women in those days, nor were they that interested in it. And you know, to go into the Foreign Service, if you got married until 1972, you had to leave the Foreign Service. A woman mm -hmm. could not be married and in the Foreign Service. I did hear that. I've heard that, yeah. actually. Not I mean, if you, it's quite extraordinary, but it tells you, it sort of reflects a thinking at the time. So that was one. The other um, social uh, um, sort of, uh, I don't know, memory that I have was the experience of being Jewish in a very Christian atmosphere. In those days, it was just very different from mm -hmm. now. So just to give you a few examples, socially, I remember I went out with one of the students, I don't know, on a date or two, very casual, and he said to me, I can't 
ask you out anymore. And I said, I just looked why. And he said, because I could never marry you um, because you're Jewish. <laughs> and no one had ever said that to me in my life before. Um, and then another fellow at the school that I went out with a couple of times, he introduced me to his mother. And his mother said to me, I understand you're Jewish, but it doesn't bother me. Now, so this, it created an atmosphere coming from New York City, which is a predominantly, or then was predominantly Jewish city. Uh, it was just another experience to be in, an, in a different environment. Uh, so I just remember those uh, memories. But in terms of the courses, they were terrific. And in terms of the professors, they were terrific. Um, I remember uh, Hal Sonnenfeld, he recently died actually, who was my professor of Soviet studies. And he was in the National Security Council at the time. Uh, and he was also teaching at night. So when we had our class with him, it was fantastic. I mean, he would give us speeches and statements that were made by Soviet leaders. What does this mean? And you know that at the NSC, that's what they were trying to figure out all day. So he knew his stuff. He knew really what was going on. And so it was a terrific learning experience of how to read between the lines in, in government statements, in understanding how to deal with situations. Um, and the other professors, too, were really excellent. I, I don't recall any class that I didn't really enjoy there. I learned a tremendous amount um, in Washington. And um, Hal Sonnenfeld and I um, met again at Brookings so many years later. And before he died, he was, had been at Brookings for a number of years, and I was there. And he was always so proud. This was my student, he used to say. And I always used to say, this was my professor. So we always had this very nice uh, relationship years later as well. Um, but anyway, I had a very good training at SICE in Washington. Uh, Bologna was a very different experience uh, than being in Washington. And very exciting in its own way. Um, it was experimental at the time because uh, West European unity was beginning to be a, an issue, uh, European integration, as they called it. Uh, this was 1962. And so all the students came from different West European countries. Uh, so we were all living together and studying together. Mm -hmm. They put us all in the same apartment buildings. And so we got to know each other very well from all different countries. And so the issue of European integration and, and all the discussions about it were with us every day, both in living and in the classrooms. So it was a very vivid experience. Uh, for me, it was the first time I'd ever met a German. And so that was quite an experience because there were a lot of German students mm -hmm. at the school. And we had to deal with the German-Jewish relationship. Uh, they, the German students initially, all knocked on my door all the time. Can we take you here? Can we do this for you? They were all ridden with guilt, even though they were too young mm -hmm. to have been directly involved. But that was the, so I had to end that idea that they have to pay me something. Nobody had to take me anywhere or do anything for me. Um, we had to have a level playing field in a way. And I was invited to Germany and I went, um, to, uh, with a whole group of us to uh, a special festival they had there. But at the time, 62, it was only about uh, 17 years after the uh, Second World War. And it was only then that Germans and Italians were beginning to talk about the Holocaust, about the fascist period in Italy. There were films coming out for the very first time. There had been a silence going on for many years. It's the first time you could really discuss these things or look at them. And so I was there right in the middle of that, and mm -hmm. that was quite extraordinary. Mm -hmm. um, and so the friendships, and there were a lot of tense feelings. Um, when I did go to Germany, quite a number of Italians at the school said to me, you shouldn't go there, you're betraying your people. We will not go. So this is how strong it was. It was 62, but I thought it was better to go. Um, but the experiences of this were something that I never hmm. thought about before I actually arrived there um, and began to meet and talk to 
Germans and how that interaction was. So that was a big issue and for the first time we learned about these issues because in college the Holocaust was treated as a, just a blip, it was sort of a paragraph um, and it, was, it, it came under the general heading of immorality, I think. Uh, it was not an issue, and um, at um, in Bologna, it was part of the class. I mean, we were dealing with contemporary Italy and contemporary Germany and contemporary France. These were the courses, and we were studying this with uh, the Italians and with the Germans and with the West Europeans. And to tell you how tense it was, at times, because everybody got on pretty well, and, and by the end of the year we felt we were, there was what you'd call this kind of integration and a lot greater understanding. Um, but there was a soccer game at the end of the year to just be part of the festivities at the end of the year. And in the soccer game, as it turned out, in terms of numbers of students, it seemed to make sense to have one team, Germans and Austrians and the other team, the West Europeans, and the Americans weren't part of because they didn't play soccer. Well, what happened is the Germans and Austrians began practicing um, a weeks or two before the game. I mean, they took it seriously. The others, it was just a game. And when the game took place and the Germans were winning very heavily, suddenly this was not acceptable. So all of that integration spirit began to break down just in a game and you had even professors jumping into the game on one side or the other. Um, the Germans won, they had a victory party and just about no one came. Um, so, you know, this was, I remember that as one, a big blip, but at the same time there was tremendous camaraderie too. So uh -huh. it was a very tense time. The other uh, very interesting experience I had is um, that Bologna was run by the Communist Party. So uh, for me this was politically broadening uh, to be in Bologna because I'd never met a communist either. And I grew up in the McCarthy period in the United States which was extremist and intolerantly anti-communist and it affected studies too. I mean every at Barnett all the classes on you know having to deal with Soviet Russia or communism or whatever usually had to end with the horrors of communism. Well there were plenty of horrors but it was almost a little ideological. Um, in Bologna you have a communist party and they're communists and they're not like Soviet communists in particular um, and they're a socialist and there's a socialist party, and we don't have in the United States the broadness of that kind of political process. They did in France, of course, and in Western Europe, but not in the United States. Mm -hmm. So uh, to suddenly realize these are people, and there are views and issues and ideologies, and one doesn't always have to have just an agenda, um, it was really eye-opening for me. Um, one funny thing I remember is that because there were so many different pastas in Italy, um, and they all sounded the same to me at first, uh, tortellini and tagliatelle and tagliini. I ordered in the, I went to the student menser at the University of, of Bologna, sometimes we ate there, some of the students, and I ordered um, Togliatti Ragù. Now Togliatti was the head of the Communist Party, but I mixed up his name with all the pastas because it sounded like that, and I said Togliatti Ragù, and the waiter said come, and I said Togliatti Ragù, that's with meat sauce, and um, he suddenly said out loud, uh, la ragazza americana ha comandato Togliatti, he said the American uh, girl or student has ordered Togliatti, and everybody started banging on the table, because they thought, you know, I was uh, one of these extreme anti-communists who was coming to attacked the Communist Party in Togliatti. And so every time I went to the Mensa, everybody banged on the table because that's what my reputation became. Uh, so I'm always careful when I order pasta. Um, but in that way, um, Bologna was a marvelous experience. Um, and I also fell in love there with an Italian, and that's a wonderful thing to remember as well. Um, so I think the whole school year was 
extremely eye-opening, terrific professors um, from France, from Italy, from Germany. Uh, really, um, you got a different perspective than you get in the United States. You want to learn something, it's very good to have a broad perspective. Mm -hmm. So I found the SICE experience a real plus. That's great, and thanks for your stories. <laughs> And what about, like, let's now come to 62, 63, and you've yeah. received your degree, and tell us a little bit about your career and, and how that launched and where it evolved. Um, well, I did discover at SAIS that I didn't want to try for the Foreign Service. Um, I realized that that was, it was too narrowly to think about at that time to, to just have everything in terms of American interests. So it didn't appeal to me. And I didn't want to work in a bank. Uh, SICE seemed to help students going to the Foreign Service or going to um, a bank. Uh, these is where students would go, or maybe to uh, an international. I don't think international organizations were on the, much on the agenda in those days. But um, so I um, was in New York, and I wasn't sure. Where to? Uh, I wasn't sure um, where to um, find my own place um, mm -hmm. in in international relations. I couldn't get help at Columbia. Mm -hmm. uh, they suggested you know either get your PhD or you can teach history, and I didn't want to do that. Um, and. Um, I found that SAIS could help with foreign service, with being in Washington, mm -hmm. working for the government, uh, or working for a bank, as I mentioned. So I turned to the New York phone book. Okay. And I went through the phone book and I w looked up everything under international. Interesting. And I just went one place after another and just called them all. I mean, unless it was clearly something that was unrelated. And some of these things you really don't know what they are. Uh, but I got down to International Review Service, so I got down to R. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a publication, uh, and it was uh, in the United Nations in the press section. And so I was hired. And so it was a wonderful beginning. It was the oh, Cuban Missile so Crisis, what and a great I was in the press. Story. I love that story. <laughs> Uh, so that was a terrific experience. So I, I kind of got launched, um, and at that time the UN was also developing standards on international human rights. So I began looking at that, which played a role in later career. But um, I worked there, I worked at a news reference service, but when I really, again, wanted to find a place to go, um, I looked in the phone book again, and I went under world this time. And, <laughs> and that took me to the World Jewish Congress. Um, I didn't know that much about Jewish issues, but they were looking for somebody to represent them at the United Nations on human rights issues. And so I did know some of that. So I got involved in international human rights standards, and I loved that. And I realized that in grad school at SICE, but also in college at Barnard, uh, there was no teaching at that time on ethics or human rights or morals, anything like that having to do with foreign policy. Uh, it was just not on the screen. And I found this very interesting. The first international human rights standards were being developed since the Second World War. So I was very attracted to that and became very involved, became a, a, a chair, a co-chair of one of their committees at the UN. These are of the non-governmental organizations that were affiliated to the UN. Um, on human rights, and then I was invited to be the executive director of the International League for Human Rights in New York, which is one of the first, the oldest American organization trying to promote international human rights, and I got particularly absorbed in trying to get the United States government to incorporate human rights in its foreign policy. So I was both raising awareness to human rights issues worldwide from this job, as well as trying to press the United States government, and it was a new field, so I was one of the pioneers, and I realized, looking back, I, I love being a pioneer. So I then um, was invited by the Carter administration to join them, because they were, um, President Carter announced uh, human rights and foreign mm -hmm. policy, and so I got a call from them and, and came to Washington, um, and had a... Um, 
extraordinary experience in the Human Rights Bureau. It was um, really a very um, exhilarating, hard, hard working, um, combative, because nobody wanted us there, um, experience trying to incorporate human rights in foreign policy. Uh -huh. uh, and we did it, I think. I mean, we were battered by many, and uh, there were efforts to try to reverse this. But um, as it worked out, the Bureau is still there, and human rights is a part of foreign policy. And it's accepted as a part of foreign policy. So I think I was very much part of that initial push. and. Um, uh, ended up in the Bureau, I was the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Security Assistance and Economic Assistance. So I would be looking at um, uh, countries and um, whether or not they should get or not get economic aid or security assistance on human rights grounds. Wow, that's And great. then how to try to fight that out, which you had to do um, in the department where the rest of the department, uh, of course, often, the, particularly the regional, the, the, the country bureaus didn't, uh, they usually wanted to give the aid anyway because they felt this interfered with relationships. And in the course of that, I met my husband actually. Uh, he was in the Near Eastern Bureau and he was the director for Israel and Israel, uh, Arab-Israeli affairs um, and I was talking about human rights in Israel mm -hmm. and he was defending Israel and I was uh, pointing out the human rights problems in the country. That's how we actually met. That's great. And then after that, where did that take you? Well, the, the Carter wasn't re-elected and I was a political appointee. So I left the State Department and I went with David uh, to Ethiopia uh, and to Togo and to England. Um, and I did a lot of writing, but in Ethiopia I had a great experience. Um, I mean, my career wasn't in human rights there anymore. I, I remember in Ethiopia um, the Rotary Club, which is a business business people in Ethiopia at the time was under a communist regime and it had been a revolution and so all the business people had been pushed aside. But they maintained themselves in the Rotary Club and they approached me once when they knew my background and said, can you come and address us on human rights but you can't mention the words. <laughs> so I said, well I don't think that's possible, but um, I did talk about um, uh, women's rights. Yeah. That, that's what. Um, there were no women present, but uh, I did talk about women's rights. Um, but I did have a job at the embassy that turned out to be something that was one of the best experiences I had professionally. Actually, it was the um, uh, public affairs uh, officer at the embassy. Uh, the the office had been kicked out, um, and. Um, because of the revolution. Uh -huh. And I began to reopen it because I realized that a lot of the population was not anti-American, just a very slim layer of the government was. So um, I um, began to redevelop the program and I had to take on the Reagan administration which did not want to do this because they said it's a communist country. I take on the Mengistu government which didn't want to have anything to do with the United States. But I did get the program reopened. I, I just did everything I could to yeah. get into the society. I took courses at the university. They didn't want me there, but I did go anyway. And I got to talk to a lot of people in the film and the uh, academics and um, uh, the Ministry of Information. And this will interest you. It turned out the Deputy Minister of Information was in Washington visiting from the University of Chicago when I was at SAIS. Hmm. And I was introduced to him at that time, so this was in 1961. And we talked a lot in those days. He was a revolutionary and I'd never met one before. Um, and so he fascinated me and he, he went on to become, uh, you know, the head of their um, the Ethiopian radio television and was now the deputy, the second in the Ministry of Information um, and had been part of this revolution. He was now a disillusioned revolutionary because the people he wanted to take over hadn't. It was the extremists, so you had a Mengistu government. But so from 1961, if you fast forward to 19, 
82, when we arrived in Ethiopia, I looked him up. I had to do it very carefully, cautiously. But he helped the United States and me with this public affairs program. Oh, wow. That's um, right. And so that was, he, be, he began it by beginning to give us some place in the newspapers and, and films and allowing, getting people to come. We weren't, no one was allowed to come to the U.S. residence, um, you know, unless there was a reason and they would take pictures of you across the street as you entered. So I had to find ways to get people to come there. I used to have movies where everyone would come in groups, so it didn't matter. Um, but uh, in any event, he helped, and eventually uh, I got him political asylum in the United States uh, and his family because uh, it was too, became too dangerous from there. But it was his sign of defection uh, being in touch with me that he could actually do something. So it was a very interesting thing that I'd met him in Washington when I was there as a student. Um, so in the end, they, the U.S. reopened their program, and I was got the uh, Superior Honor Award of the United States Information Agency. Um, and the program is alive and well when I left and, and expanded. And I think it was a very good way of subverting a lot of the communist influence mm -hmm. um, and reaching out to the public, which didn't like that kind of influence. Uh, and didn't like what was happening and all the brutality and the information control. So it was a, it was a sort of job of subverting uh, for three years. I, I enjoyed it tremendously. That's great. <laughs> That's um, great. From there, in Ethiopia, I saw for the first time displaced populations. Um, and these were people who were uprooted by war and famine. Uh, and the government was persecuting them, they had no place to go. So these were displaced populations. They weren't refugees because they didn't cross the border, but they were uprooted by civil war in their own country and they were being fought against by the government and not helped. And I saw there was no help for such people. You had to cross the border to become a refugee. So when I went back to the States, I was offered a number of jobs in the human rights field, which had been my field before I went abroad. Um, and I did quite a bit of writing when I was abroad of articles on human rights, but I didn't want to go back to doing what I did before. Um, I wanted to help um, bring together the human rights and humanitarian fields. I felt that the human rights community was very riveted at that time on sort of individual prisoners and, you know, cases of trials and freedom of the press, but not in the broader case of humanitarian emergencies. That was sort of left to humanitarian agencies. So um, I began working at a small think tank in Washington, the Refugee Policy Group, and began to work on internally displaced populations. And again, it was a kind of a pioneering job because it was a subject just like human rights was when I began with it. Nobody ever heard of an internally displaced person. Um, so I began writing and looking into this and was invited to come to the Brookings Institution and helped get a um, representative of the UN Secretary General on the subject and get it into the UN Human Rights Commission agenda and then worked from, let's see, I guess it was about 1994 to 2007 um, with the, the UN representative, the Secretary mm -hmm. General. And, we worked together um, and got that issue on the international agenda and went all around the world getting uh, different organizations, civil society in countries around the world, engaged in the subject where they had displaced populations and developed, um, with part of developing human rights standards for internally displaced populations that eventually the UN in 2005 um, endorsed as part of their World Summit document. Uh, so this was setting up a kind of international institutional arrangement for IDPs, as they're called. Uh, there had been one for refugees. There's a refugee agency, there's a refugee convention, there's a um, refugee um, practices and standards and books and handbooks, and we began trying to do something similar for internally displaced persons. And I would say it's a tremendous job, so no one can say, well, we did it. But we accomplished a lot, and um, Francis Deng, with whom I worked, who, who is um, now the South Sudan ambassador at the UN, uh, he was at Brookings with me, and we both won something called the Grelmar Award for Ideas Improving World Order. It's a big cash award that's announced. 
Um, and so we did, we did, we did books and articles and then all this worldwide activity and traveling. So it was a very exciting period and I, I think that we did a lot to bring those kinds of displaced populations inside the country onto the international agenda and get institutions, governments to begin to help them. That's great. Uh, it was considered a sovereignty issue before. It's in their own country. You can't do anything to help them. Um, you can only help people who come outside. And we sort of broke that barrier. Um, and I think that has stuck. I mean, it's still a mm -hmm. tremendous challenge. But that the, that has been um, an area that I have been very involved in. So I still, I retired in 2007, but I have written a lot since then. I speak a lot. I lecture. I'm on the teach at American University to Law School a course on displaced populations in the summertime. And last summer I was invited to Oxford to teach on the same thing. I had people, students coming from all over the world that worked with displaced populations um, so that we could um, come together and they could understand the history of all this and, and some of the framework for looking at it. Um, and um, I'm the co-chair of a group in Washington, this is sort of my next um, involvement, is on North Korea and the human rights mm -hmm. situation there, which is so abysmal that I um, decided to get involved in this as a, it's just on a pro bono basis. And it's a sort of high-powered group in Washington called the Committee for Human Rights in North Korea. And it's a lot of work bringing attention um, making statements, writing things, articles, and op-eds, um, and uh, co-chairing the group. So I've been come quite involved with that as right now, as well as displaced populations. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's 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 a both. That's great. And I remain associated with Brookings. I, I'm a non-resident uh -huh. fellow at Brookings, and I have an association at Georgetown as well. So I I think I flunked retirement. I guess that's my. <laughs> Or you just, or you're flunking. You will maybe get there. Well, that's great. Thank you so much for, for letting us know of your, your career. And, wow, I think it would be really great. Uh, students could benefit, I guess, from knowing, uh, looking back now, what advice might you have for current students today, given your life and your career? Um, I guess what comes out at me is you have many different careers. Um, years ago, I guess when I began, it, it seemed like you have one career. You do this and you plot some career trajectory, you know, of where you'll be. And, and you really don't have to do that, I think, anymore. Um, you can work in government, you can work in a think tank, you can work for an international organization. You can do it all. You can work at all these kinds of jobs. You don't have to keep doing it forever. And people um, really have to think broadly, um, not just about one thing they know, but about all the potential and possibilities they have. Because you, you sort of accumulate a lot of different skills that suit you for many different positions. Um, and I know SAIS prepared me well for, in terms of analyzing uh, foreign policy events, uh, writing, uh, speaking, and um, history, historical background, um, debating, things like this. And, and these kinds of skills work well in many different settings. Um, and so I wasn't quite sure when I began where I would land up. Um, but I found that um, by following what interested me, um, what concerned me, uh, and I always wanted to make a better world, and that's not always a goal for everyone. Uh, so if I became concerned about an issue, whether it was human rights or human rights and foreign policy or internally displaced persons, I just went after it mm -hmm. and applied all my skills and either affiliated with some institution where I could do that. Um, and realizing that you can have many different careers and go back to one and come back to another and, and you don't have to have one line. But I guess the one thing that I would hope is that too many young people become too bureaucratic um, and they feel that they'll get ahead by uh, 
not making waves and not really being true to their own values or what they think. They ask somebody else to tell them what to think. Uh, they, there's a line, and what is the line, and they'll follow it. And this, of course, is true to some extent in the Foreign Service um, and other institutions as well. And I've always thought, I've always preferred, in any event, shaking up the place. And I think that uh, there's room for that as well, and there should be room for that as well. You should be able to think what you think without being told what you're supposed to think. And I know that in working on human rights that has to be the case because you have enough challenging you against it. And for displaced populations as well, all these institutions that I um, got with others to help displaced populations, there was tremendous pushback at first because it was a new idea. And new ideas are wonderful to push and wonderful to, to achieve and, and get across, but it takes a lot of fighting and it doesn't take group think. You've got to ungroup think and be ready to stand up for something and get people thinking. And so if you're inclined in that direction, do it. That's great. Well, thank you so much for your time and thanks for sharing your life stories. And <laughs> everybody will really appreciate it. Well, good. Have a great day. Okay.